Okay, finally, we will have the announcement of TCTAP Award, Master of the Masters. The award will be presented by Dr. Sung Jung Park. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, our special ceremony for the ninth TCT AP Award the Master of the Masters 2019. Uh, since 2011, so we have bestowed Master of Masters on one of the outstanding teachers, actually, who has made a remarkable contribution to the development of cardiovascular medicine and the growth of uh, our TCTAP meeting. Uh, so far, uh, we uh, given uh, Master Masters Award to the eight masters, have been awarded uh, by doing their outstanding expertise, uh, really uh, appreciate it uh, to them for their hard work and dedication on behalf of all cardiologists and TCT AP committee. The past recipient, uh, Dr. Nobuyoshi, uh, Masaki Nobuyoshi, Marie Dion, Antonio Columbus, Gary Mint, and Spencer King, Barry Rutherford, Eberhard Grube, uh, last year's David Holmes uh, uh, received. And uh, I'd like to introduce the next hero uh, for the ninth Master Masters Award. Please. Please. Interventional cardiology is paved by the contributions of Patrick, starting from QCA to plain balloon angioplasty stains, uh, drug eluting stains, bioresorbable scaffolds. Uh, every field uh, is uh, uh, attached uh, to uh, important papers by Patrick. He has been a master of accumulating of defining very large data sets. Data sets are related to imaging, such as early days of quantitative coronary angiography. Data sets related to intravascular ultrasound, data sets related to OCT. Those were clinical data sets. There were other data sets that he was able to master, and in mastering that, identified approaches to educate us and take us forward as we thought further about the field of intervention cardiology. The name Patrick Soroyes is really synonymous with interventional cardiology. Patrick has really been involved in every seminal investigation in our subspecialty from the beginning. And I can't think of a single scientist 
who more comprehensively integrates an understanding of basic science and intravascular imaging and pathophysiology to clinical outcomes. The development of interventional cardiology would be totally incomplete without Patrick Soros. The trials you have done, the drive you have had, the things that you have driven to help us understand better this specialty are unparalleled. Patrick is the dean, he is the pope of academic interventional cardiology for the past four decades. What he has done to be able to elevate the field from the standpoint of academic recognition and clinical evidence has literally put interventional cardiology on the map. I mean, the young cardiologist certainly should not look to the past. He should always be curious about the future because that will be his career. If he sees something new which has not yet been explored, there he has to go there. That's the place to work, that's the place to discover new things. When I was younger, Patrick was already, for all of us, the guru of interventional cardiology and his knowledge was out of proportion and unreachable. Today he remains a leader for all of us thanks to his um, wisdom, knowledge, culture and ability to foresee future directions in our field. I'm personally very grateful that I could join you, um, your team since 2007. Uh, I have learned uh, so many things, not only about uh, intervention cardiology, but about so many other stuff like uh, basics in the human communications, basics in the uh, scientific communications, and how to put the people on the same page. I couldn't be more thrilled to congratulate Patrick Sarais as this year's recipient as the Master of Masters of TCTAP. Uh, Patrick is not only a superb scientist, he is a well-rounded clinician, a superb human being and above everything a great friend. I can say that I'm proud of being one of his friends. I would summarize as saying Patrick is the master of the master of the masters. I think uh, you are the uh, most deserving winner I could imagine for this award. Congratulations, Petri. From part of your academic research team in Rotterdam, we congratulate you, Professor Sarais. Congratulations! I have a motto that may sound socialistic, but it's not. The group is stronger than the individual because today, intelligence is collective and working together is the key to success. And we are one, after all, you and I. Together we suffer, together we exist, and forever we will recreate each other. It's really with uh, 
a great emotion. I mean, uh, it's amazing what you could see, what you have achieved in the life. It seems so short, and uh, we all have done so much. Some of the pictures were really a shock for me, and uh, I really enjoy it. I hope I will have a copy of this film to show it to my grandchildren. So I'm supposed to do a, a lectures. Um, uh, the title is uh, Angiography for Assessment of Regurgitation Post Taver, the Minimalist Approach and the Return of the Jedi. I mean, uh, my first uh, aortic valve replacement was in 2004 with uh, Alain Cribier, and later on with uh, Eberhardt uh, with the core valve. And uh, I've been amazed by the fact that uh, um, it took some time to simplify the procedure. I think that it's clear that we have to quantify the orthography for regurgitation after TAVI, and I'll show you why to use the orthography. I'm, of course, a great uh, supporter of uh, echocardiography, and it's true that uh, in the ACCHA guideline, it is said that the trans is an indispensable imaging test for evaluating patients with chronic aortic regurgitation and guiding appropriate treatment decision. But uh, is that so? I'm in charge of a very large lab of uh, echocardiography, and I think that uh, during acquisition uh, in the lab of outside the lab, aortic regurgitation assessment is markedly, markedly influenced by the imaging plane. You could see here the kind of uh, aortic regurgitation that you have at the annular level, and then the uh, proximal edge of the transcatheter heart valve. Echocardiography is an art. There's no doubt about that, and a difficult one. And if you look at this, uh, uh, short axis view, uh, it's clear that there is a low sensitivity to detect the jet in certain locations, and these locations are mainly the posterior jet. It doesn't matter if you take the apical three chambers view, the parasternal long axis view, the apical five chambers view, or the parasternal short axis view. We have with uh, Mohamed Abdel Ghani and myself in the European Heart Journal showing the low sensitivity to detect uh, the certain location, the jet. I like the call up, but uh, if you go to Cleveland, Colombia, Washington, Quebec, and New York, and you have these great experts, Rebecca Ann, Philippe Barreau, Ney Welsman, Leon Rodriguez, and others, using a classification with four class of a classification with a seven class, look at the kappa agreement between this call up 0.481517, I would qualify the reproducibility as weak. If you look at the intermodality, if you compare uh, echo with angiography, you have a consistency of 53%. If you look at the echo versus uh, magnetic resonance, it's even low, 33%. And finally, we are in the minimalist phase. I mean, transesophageal echo and general asthenesthesia has disappeared. And transthoracic echo and eyes are even difficult to get in the lab. So we have angiography, which is friendly, available, quick, the sum of all jet, regardless the sum of uh, level and trajectories. Uh, of course, it is qualitative, subjective, and validation is doubtful. There is an history of video densitometry, because you will remember that in the 80s, orthography has been dethroned by echocardiography for the iterative and non-invasive assessment of aortic regurgitation in the pre-Taver era. And there was a lot of quantification and good paper based basically on the time density 
to assess the regurgitation. So we have uh, resurrect that technique. Basically, you have a zone of reference, and then you have the region of interest, and everything who goes to the left ventricle has to go through the region of interest. And you have these uh, time density curve in the reference and in the region of uh, uh, interest. And you could see here that we are quantifying the video densitometry during two or three or four cycle. Now, if you look at the cellars and you have uh, one, two, three, four observers, uh, it's clear that the kappa value for the assessment of regurgitation is between 0.47 and 0.60. While with the time density curve, uh, the difference is basically zero. The boundaries of agreement is uh, 5%. And if you look at the coefficient of regression, it is 0.98. We have validated that uh, in vitro and in vivo, you see the cat lab here with the C arm on the side. Uh, this is the pump, that's the injector. Uh, basically, the model is here. You have the aorta, an aorta in silicone, and then you have the left ventricle, which is uh, in plastic. And in between, you have the valve. The valve is inserted between these two tubes. And then uh, what was smart is that we create a small screw, a non-radiopaque transparent. And with that screw, we can deform, uh, in this case, an Edwards valve. And we do that progressively. And thanks to this uh, transonic probe, we can record the forward and backward uh, cardiac output. And you see the technician here screwing progressively to have a regression of 14, uh, 13, and 15. And that, at that moment, we perform the uh, aortic angio in vitro. You see here the forward uh, uh, wave and the uh, retrograde wave, the, the regurgitation in this case 12%. 24% and 41%. This is the valve has been slightly modified and you have a regurgitation of 8%. Here there's a major deformation and you have 43% and you can appreciate here the color code video, video densitometry uh, uh, during the different cycle. Now it's uh, good that you can use synchronized or insynchronized injection the big advantage of the synchronize is that you have to inject only 8 cc, which is good for a patient. But as you could see, the coefficient of correlation with the analysis by uh, video densitometry is very good above uh, 0.97. Then we went in the animal and we had the crazy uh, uh, model. Uh, we put the wire in the left ventricle and then we open uh, wall stem, more or less, I mean, long one cell of the femoral so that we can uh, prevent the co-optation of the leaflet. And uh, you see the final uh, model. You see here uh, a wall stem of 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 millimeter, recording the video density, densitometry, the time density here, and also recording the so-called RE, the diastolic ratio of the diastolic pressure. So this is an example of a stiff Y with a moderate uh, regurgitation. This is a, a wall stent of uh, six millimeter, which is open between the leaflet. Here, a seven millimeter between the leaflet, and finally, a uh, 10 millimeter between the leaflet, with certainly a, a cellar a four. And you see the regurgitation video densitometry going from 12, 23, 39, 55. And certainly the relationship was beautifully uh, linear if you look at the fully unconstrained nominal stand, but also looking at the area of the uh, orifice by QCA. Now, we were, of course, challenged by the clinician, uh, the echocardiographist, the transthoracic echo, and this is one of the first uh, paper with Mohamed Abdelghani, 
where we showed that the area under the curve was quite uh, substantial, 0.84, with uh, a cutoff point of 0.17. 17% of regurgitation is the difference between, for us, between mild and uh, moderate. That's what is said in this line. And later on, we discover also that this uh, value of 0.17 had a very important impact on the uh, prognostic. So after the transthoracic echo, we went to the transesophageal echo, and again, we found a good uh, discrimination between non and trace, mild, moderate. This is the different view you can get a quite good relationship between the circumferential extent of the regurgitation and the regurgitation by video densitometry. And again, we were pleased to see that the cutoff point in transesophageal echo for regurgitation by video densitometry was 16%, and we knew that this 16% has a prognostic value on the long term I'll show you later. Correlation with uh, MRI, we went to our friend Mohamed Abdel Wahab in uh, Segeberger in Germany, and then we correlate the uh, video densitometry regurgitation in the left ventricular outflow tract with the uh, MRI, which gives you the beautiful forward and backward uh, signal. And the population analyzed was uh, quite a uh, large spectrum, as you could see, going up to 40% of regurgitation. And although the measurements were not done simultaneously, uh, the relationship for a biological relationship is quite good, uh, 0.48, 78 uh, LVO2 uh, regurgitation versus the regurgitation in the, um, with the MRI in 135 patients. Guidance of the procedure has been uh, used uh, mainly by our friend in uh, Brazil. They have uh, collected 61 uh, cases. You see here before dilatation, uh, a regurgitation of 20%. You can appreciate that on the uh, color-coded signal and on the wave of the regurgitation. They did the post dilatation and they reduced this regurgitation to 6%. You can appreciate on the color coded and also on the wave. All this uh, paper has been uh, published by now. Now, what is important is that uh, in this case, that post dilated, uh, in general, the regurgitation prior to the dilatation was 24%, and after dilatation, 12%. Uh, you know that our uh, criteria of regurgitation for moderate is 17 percent. Maybe some of these lesions should not have been post dilated because they didn't get better, but certainly all the ones were above uh, 17 percent did improve. And what is important is that uh, when you have uh, a regurgitation above uh, 17, uh, your mortality at the four years is 34 percent while when it is below 17, it is 19%. This is what we have uh, confirmed in a much larger series of the uh, uh, registry from uh, Brazil with uh, Pedro Lemos and many of our friends. You could see in the univariate, but also in the multivariate, that a regurgitation of 17% has a bad prognostic value. You see the curve here of the individual who have a, a mild, less than 17% regurgitation with a survival rate of 68.3%, uh, and here the one who have a regurgitation of more than 17% and a survival of 39.5%. Finally, difference among valve type and uh, trial assessment. Uh, the most recent publication, Jack, was about the Lotus. As you could see, we could get uh, 422 uh, autography analyzed. I have to emphasize something very, very important, is that without the protocol of uh, acquisition, in a post analysis, you will lose some of the material because there is uh, 
overlapping of the descending aorta with the region of interest because you have sometimes radiopaque structures in the region of interest like a transesophageal probe. You can have a motion of the patient and the table. Uh, you can have uh, not enough cine filming. You need at least a four art cycle and you may have overlapping of the descending aorta. That's really the last topic on which we have working because we were re uh, happy with the result obtained in the uh, Lotus, since in the Lotus there were no regurgitation in 334 patients, 46 trays, 41 mild, only one moderate, and you could see here the good, uh, again, the good discrimination uh, uh, echo versus uh, video densitometry. This is a quite interesting uh, picture because it's uh, 1,182 Ks of uh, Lotus, Core Valve, Evolute R, Sapiens 3, Sapien XT, and Core Valve. It's clearly two generations. Uh, you see here in red uh, the large majority, with one exception, uh, the Lotus has a very low regurgitation of 2%, followed by the core valve Evolute with 3%, uh, the Sapien with 5%, the Sapien x stay by 9%, and the original core valve by 9%. And this is graphically the tip, the grade of uh, regurgitation that you can see with the Lotus Evolute, Evolute R, Sapien 3, Sapien XT, and Core Valve. The last point is the uh, acquisition, which will be uh, presented at the late breaking session in uh, Euro PCR. But uh, it's clear that uh, if you have uh, in your uh, place a Tremensio, you can the day before, you can the day before uh, clearly uh, select the projection uh, which is the ideal projection for the uh, uh, region of interest. You see that in the LAO cranial 90 and 26, the region of interest will be completely separate of the descending aorta, and the next day in the lab you can do that. We ask our friend of the University of Yamaguchi to do a pilot initially with 92 patients, they were doing the video densitometry without protocol in 54 of these patients. And as you could see, analyzable for all kind of uh, superimposition was 57%. Uh, Non-analyzable, 23 analyzable, uh, 31, 57%. When they uh, introduced the protocol based on Trimensio, they jumped immediately consecutively to 100% of uh, uh, assessment being analyzable. So, as I said, uh, at the Europosier uh, next month, we will uh, present uh, the work of uh, down in Rotterdam, Montreal, Yamaguchi, Germany, and uh, Amsterdam, uh, proving that we have had these kind of uh, uh, analysis. And the final step, is a good one since the industry, Philips, get interested in that uh, process. And uh, uh, you see here the online unit in the lab of uh, Amsterdam. So I think that technique will facilitate the work of the interventional cardiologist interested by the structural. And for me, it was a great pleasure to go from the technical stuff to the clinical stuff. Thank you very much.